Hello, everyone. We're coming in on today on Christmas Eve, which is actually a new one for me. But we're coming in today because I want to do this one little video this week before Christmas. And I, of course, was not going to put the video out on Christmas because everyone's usually busy on Christmas, including myself. And I'm not saying everyone's going to see this today either, but they'll see it in time. But I wanted to go ahead and do another video that I wanted to get done here before the year came to a close, mostly due to a significant milestone anniversary that is occurring tomorrow on Christmas Day, among many milestone anniversaries that have probably happened on Christmas Day. But this particular milestone still holds much premise today, still holds much importance, and it's something that happened relatively recently in terms of history. And tomorrow is Christmas Day, of course, and it will mark the 30th anniversary, 30 years ago, on Christmas Day in 1991, the Soviet Union, the longtime communist state and former adversary of the United States, finally dissolved, came to an official end on Christmas Day of 1991, which of course at the time was praised worldwide, in the West at least, as a significant triumph over communism. It was the ultimate triumph, and we won the Cold War. Now, that has led to certain political implications today on the global international stage, especially in U.S. and Russia relations and Russian relations with other Western nations. But I wanted to go, go ahead and do a video on just a brief breakdown of how this dissolution came to be, how the Soviet Union eventually came to collapse from being this former major world superpower up there with the United States to eventually just falling apart and basically separating into its individual independent little states that had formerly comprised it. So this shouldn't be an excessively long video. This is more of a summer, summerical video. We're probably not going to go in as much detail as I would like just because for the sake of time, it would just get too complicated. So for the sake of this, this is more going to just kind of be a brief little summary of how this occurs, how the Soviet Union goes from being a superpower to no longer a present state. And then at the end, I would like to express a little bit of why this is still politically imperative, why this is still kind of influencing Russian behavior today. So to kind of start off here, we need to at least have a little bit of a background with the Soviet Union, exactly what it was. Odds are, if you attended United States schooling or any schooling in the West, you've heard of the Soviet Union. You've probably seen the red flag with the hammer and sickle up in the upper left corner. Everyone's Everyone's typically familiar with the Soviet Union. They're very familiar with it, especially those that grew up during the Cold War, and there's still many of us that did around. I mean, it was fairly recent that it ended. It was only 30 years ago. So there's still most of your parents, most parents are going to have grown up during that time era. Anyone born before 1991, I would say actually anyone born before 19... Uh, 1985 ought to have some fairly good memories of just the ongoing tie, not ties, but with uh, hostil hostilities with the Soviet Union. But a little background, of course, the Soviet, and this will tie into a future video that I think we're going to do next week, because I do want to do the Russian Revolution. But as a little bit br brief background to the Soviet Union, it officially comes about in 1922. Of course, the Soviet Union emerges it really starts to emerge in 1917 in the October Revolution of that year in which Vladimir Lenin and his Bolshevik communists kind of seize power from the Russian provisional government that had kind of governed the country since March of that year when the Tsar abdicated. And him and the Bolsheviks, kind, Lenin and the Bolsheviks kind of implement their own nation, own government. They start reformatting and reorganizing Russian society to fit their view of a perfect communist socialist society, which at the time was Russia was actually became the very first communist state in the world at the time during the late 1910s, early 1920s when this happens. Now, Lenin is not unchallenged when he does this. There are a significant faction of people in Russia who do not support communism. And while they don't get along with other factions within the country, 
they are united through a common cause of they hate Bolshevism. They hate communism. They do not want to live under it. And thus, when Lenin seizes power, it's not like a clean sweep of power where you seize power and nothing happens. You can just consolidate your rule. It's not Star Wars. <laughs> it is more of right after Lenin seizes power, not a few months afterward, civil war breaks out in Russia between the Red Army, which is the Bolsheviks' army, the Reds, the communists. And then you have what was called the White Army, which is basically every non-Bolshevik Russian that is opposing the Bolshevik government, and they're fighting for multi-reasons. I mean, some of them just don't want to live under communism. Some of them wish to reinstate the Tsar, an imperialist regime, but they're united through a common cause of they do not like communism and Bolshevism. And this civil war continues from basically 1918 through 1920. And eventually, of course, I think it's evident the the red the Reds win, the Whites lose. Many of them actually leave Russia. They go into exile into other Western countries such as France, Britain, the United States, and the Reds and the Bolsheviks officially now have full control of Russia by 1920, and they are able to really start implementing and establishing this official state. Now, in the process of establishing that official state, Lenin also is able to draw in many of the former satellite states, kind of, that had been part of the Russian Empire, such as, especially in the case of Ukraine and Belarus. And he kind of combines them all and has them join in this official Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or Soviet Union for short. And this officially comes about in 1922. Now, it, the different nations that make up the Soviet Union, when we say Soviet Union, we refer to it as a nation, but it was largely a collection, a union of several different states within it that today are independent nations, but it was not just one single entity. It was divided up, kind of like we are here in the United States. So what you had was Soviet republics that constituted the Soviet Union, and these were the following Soviet republics, consisted of this. You had the Russian Soviet Republic the Ukrainian, the Belarusian, Uzbek, Kazakh, Georgian, Azerbaijan, Lithuanian, Moldavian, Latvian, Kyrgyz, Tajik, Armenian, Turkmen, and Estonian. Now keep in mind, not all of these joined outright. In particular, the Estonian, Latvian, and Lithuanian socialist republics were kind of invaded by the Soviet Union just prior to World War II and kind of forced to join. They weren't original Soviet republics, the Baltic states as we would know them as. Now, the Soviet Union, it was meant, in Lenin's view, to be a true democratic society where everyone was equal. Wage, they would be paid the same wage, no one could own a private business and charge more than another, Communism focuses on an economic system. It despises capitalism where there's a lot of private business and a market economy where basically people determine the prices. They can, individual organizations and businesses, they control the prices and prices can vary. Where in a more command economy, as the Soviet Union envisions through communism, the government largely regulates and controls the economy extensively. As in, the government determines what the wage is. The government determines exactly what people can, uh, that people cannot run a private business. And there is very much any deviation from that line, you face reprisal from the government. Now, you might say, well, is that really different from here in the United States? Well, we have a federal wage, minimum wage, yes. But when I'm saying that the Soviet Union set its own wages for workers, I'm meaning that as the same guy working, let's say that we're in the, let's say this is the Soviet Union, and we got a guy working at a factory, and we got a guy working at a restaurant. That restaurant worker will be paid the same amount as the guy at the factory, regardless of who's doing more work, because the government will set the wage, and we're here, the individual states can do a state minimum wage that's higher than the federal minimum wage. Like, I know that is the case here in Ohio, where the federal wage is, I think, seven twenty-five an hour, and in Ohio right now, I believe, is eight seventy-five or eight twenty-five. It's somewhere within that eight-dollar range. But in the Soviet Union, this would not be the case. An individual so so socialist republic such as Russia could not impose a wage that was higher than what the official communist ruling communist party stated it would be. 
You had to adhere to the government. There was no other choice. And this command economy is what differentiates the Soviet Union because the view was that in capitalism, because you have all this opportunity for private businesses and organizations and corporations to kind of take control and just uh, dominate the economy, the idea was that it creates this major wealth gap, which we see. There's, there are certain individuals who get rich quick, and then those who are lower, like the employees, are usually left in the dust scrambling for money. Communism viewed that this will solve that problem if everyone is paid the same wage. Well, and there's no private enterprise. The government controls all major businesses in the country. Well, it doesn't really solve the problem because it also adds lots of opportunity for corruption to envelop because what if you get a corrupt official in the government? The government official is going to get rich quick, but common people aren't. Basically, I would put communism as this. It sounds good on paper. It sounds like a good idea on paper. But whenever it's actually attempted to be carried out, it fails almost every single time. In fact, I will say every single time because even China, who is one of the largest powers in the world today and is officially communist, even China has had to adopt certain capitalist economic measures in order to keep itself functioning. Even they have had to stray away a little bit from the pure communism line in order to continue functioning. Now, the Communist Party rules singly in Russia. It, it has absolute dominance as a single party system. There are no other political parties in Russia allowed to intervene in, in, in the elections. So already, the Soviet Union is not democratic because only one party has legitimacy to even have power in the nation. The other problem is, although it's supposed to be this true democratic society and a union of equals, as Lenin had thought, it was no secret that the one Soviet republic that kind of pulled and dominated all the strings was Russia. Russia was the head of the Soviet Union. Even the Soviets knew that. Most Soviets wouldn't even call themselves Soviets. They called themselves Russians because they knew, odds are, if you're from the Soviet Union, you're probably from Russia. <laughs> And Russia held most of the power in this union. So it wasn't anything but an equal democratic union. It was actually quite autocratic. It was quite repressive. And, and it's kind of ironic because this was part of the reason why the Russian people had kind of had a revolution against the Tsar. was because they claimed that the Tsar was autocratic and he was an absolute ruler. Well, the Soviet Union, in reality, they weren't much different. <laughs> but yet the people didn't complain as much, at least not in the beginning. Now, of course, we come to this big period chunk of Soviet history between 1924, when Lenin dies, and 1953. The Soviet Union is guided by one man, and that man, I think, is fairly famous in terms of history, in terms of most people who are familiar with the Soviet Union. They've probably also heard of this figure, and that is no, none other than Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin rules as an absolute dictator between 1924 and 1953. And he basically does this by eliminating any of his rivals within the Communist Party ranks, either by basically chastising and kind of turning political favor away from them, or his more common method was to have you eliminated, usually through poisoning, assassination, sending you to a labor camp, anything he could think of to get you out of his way if he viewed you as a possible traitor. And Stalin was paranoid because during his regime, he also continued what we now call purges of supposedly unloyal communist officials in which he would send them to these deportation labor camps in Siberia where it is freezing cold, where there was basically very little protection against the elements. Basically, you were sent there to die and work to death. Stalin rules with an iron fist during his rule. Any dissent within his nation against him is repressed brutally. He basically sends anyone that's an enemy or critic away. He enforces collectivization on farms, especially in Belarus and Ukraine, in order to try to up the Soviet Union's agricultural output, but it fails massively because it adds to creates a famine that envelopes this breadbasket region of the Soviet Union, and millions die because of it during the 1930s. 
After 1945, after the end of the World War II, the Soviet Union enters the Cold War with the West and the United States, mostly due to the outcome that comes out from the Second World War, where the Soviet Union liberates a lot of Eastern Europe from the Nazi, from the Nazi Germany, while the West kind of liberates a lot of the West. And the Soviets, they suffer the most out of any country during World War II, except maybe China. China may have gotten just slightly off worse, but... The Soviet Union is so uh, traumatized, figuratively, from World War II out of this fear because for the first, for twice during the first half of the 20th century, Russia is invaded by Germany and it just busts through. We had World War I where Germany basically shattered the Russian Empire, which led to the revolution. And then we also have World War II where initially Hitler and his army just plowed through the Soviet Union until they started getting turned back. But either way, millions of Russians died. And Stalin and the Soviet leaders are now in the view that they want to prevent the Soviet Union from ever being invaded again. So they create what was called the Iron Curtain, where they kind of take control of these Eastern European nations that they liberated. They install communist governments within them against the will of the people. And any attempt to get rid of these communist governments is met with brutal military repression by the Soviet Union. So although they are officially supposedly states, we commonly know them as satellite states because they weren't really having full sovereignty. Because at any moment, the Soviet Union could just send its army in there and force them to cooperate with the Soviet line of foreign policy. And this ticks off the West. The West views this as a traitor traitor of the Soviet Union because they have been allies during the war, and now this, they view that the Soviet Union is trying to establish its own dictatorship in Europe, where they just fought to eliminate the Nazi Germans. So this creates animosity between the West and the Soviet Union, not to mention that they've long had suspicions against each other. The communists have long preached that the socialist revolution will take place worldwide, that there will be, it will spring up in every country around the globe, while the West is constantly denouncing the repressive and totalitarianism of communism and this just creates animosity between the two between the two regions especially with the United States and Soviet Union who emerge as two of the greatest powers and military might after the end of the war and this largely continues for the second half of the 20th century where you have these two nu nuclear armed powers who are literally on the brink of war and it would only take the slightest mishap to set each other off eventually what we come to refer to is mutually assured, mutually assured destruction, or MAD, basically is what evolves during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. And that is basically the premise that if you attack the other country with nukes, although you will probably hurt millions in that country, you will be mutually assuring your own destruction because that country will fire nukes back at you. So this basically, the fear of reprisal, of a retaliation is what kind of keeps these nations, I think, from actually going to full-blown war because they know that if they actually attack the other, the other has the capacity to do just as much damage to them. Instead, they go through proxy wars such as Vietnam and Korea where they kind of encourage and instigate these little, bat, little side wars and other nations that they're supporting individual sides in that war to fight it for them. Now, Stalin's brutal dictatorship, he dies in 1953, is later actually denounced by the Soviet Union. They come to realize just how much of a brute Stalin was, especially under the premiership of General Secret Secretary Nikita Khrushchev during the late 1950s, early 1960s. And Khrushchev actually starts the process of de-Stalinization, where they actually come out to admit a lot of these things that Stalin did and come out to actually kind of de-Stalinify the Soviet Union, get rid of a lot of the laws and implications and political prisoners that Stalin had placed and just kind of remove or free them. And although this makes the Soviet Union slightly less repressive than it had been for roughly the last 30 years, it does not solve the repressiveness overall just due to the way that communism and communist parties working. Now, this logic continues until 1985, toward the very end, and that is when Mikhail Gorbachev becomes Soviet leader. Gorbachev, Gorbachev, I say Gorbachev, some people say it differently, 
I apologize if I say it wrong. But Gorbachev is a very unique Soviet leader, as he's not very much a hardliner. He's very much the opposite. Gorbachev holds a basically a platform in his mind for political reform in the Soviet Union, which is unheard of at that time. He wants to reform and revive the Soviet economy, which by the 1985 is struggling behind the United States, mostly in part due to when President Ronald Reagan takes power in the United States, he basically restarts the nuclear military race with the Soviet Union. And while it was criticized here at home, it did have an impact on the Soviet Union because Reagan knew the Soviets were already, their economy was already starting to stagnate and kind of get uh, in decay. And Reagan knew that the Soviets, if I start building up more nukes, they'll be pressed to do the same. But the Soviets don't have the money to do this for long without having major e negative economical impact, which is exactly what starts happening. The Soviet Union starts basically going bankrupt because it's spending all this money trying to up its defenses with the United States. So when Gorbachev takes power, he wants to change things in the Soviet Union. And he introduces two major new policies called Glasnost and Perestroika. Now, Glasnost means political openness, and this is a game, both of these policies end up being game changers and catalysts as to why the Soviet Union falls. With Glasnost, it eliminates any remainders of Stalinist oppression within Russia, mostly like and during Stalin's regime, certain books that Stalin didn't approve of were banned in Russia. There was the secret police that were constantly feared throughout Russia during its during the Soviet in the Soviet Union during its tenure, where if you did anything wrong, the Soviet Union or the, the secret police or the KGB are gonna come after you. And basically, although it doesn't abolish the secret police, Glasnost sees that the secret police are at least brought out into the open and not so much secret anymore. Banning books is mostly ended. Most books are their bans on them are now lifted. Political prisoners are released from prisons due to opposition to the government. New parties could now participate in Soviet elections, so no longer is the Soviet Union a one-party, single-party system. Other political parties can now have a chance in national elections. And newspapers, the big change that comes with Glasnost, other than the party system, is that newspapers can now print criticism of the government. Beforehand, this had been banned. You, if you disagreed with the government, you couldn't really speak out or even write about anything on it, because if you did, the government would put you in jail. Now, Gorbachev with Glasnost lifts this restriction and saying, okay, you can criticize us, it's just a newspaper. The other policy that he introduces is perestroika, also known as economic restructuring. And this is focusing on trying to revive the Soviet economy, which is becoming stagnated by the late 1980s. And what this does, perestroika loosens the government's grip on the economy. It essentially, basically almost abolishes the command economy that the Soviet Union had kind of had since 1922 when it was founded. It abolishes this government grip on the economy. It starts opening up to a market economy with capitalism, kind of like China has. Individuals can now own private businesses within Russia, and this leads to a host of Western businesses now coming into Russia, such as very famously, I think in 1990, you can go on YouTube, and they have like the old news clips from when in 1990, I believe that was the year at least, that the first McDonald's came to Russia. And that was a big deal because that was a Western style restaurant business chain that under former Soviet economic policies, there was no way it could even enter Russia. Now, since they've allowed private businesses to come in there that's not officially owned by the government, McDonald's can operate in Russia. And so can other private businesses. People can start their own little shoe store or whatever. But this opens up a market economy within Russia and abolishes the command economy. But this actually does more harm than good because market economy, like any economy, it takes time to establish this. This basically abolishes the command economy overnight before the market economy has really had time to even build up. And this ends up being negative because it's too much change too quick. It's good change, yes, but it should not have been as 
quick as it was, at least not if Gorbachev had wanted to save the Soviet Union as a whole. He also, Perestroika also allows another critical change in the workforce and that it allows that workers can now go on strike. Beforehand, any strikes in the Soviet Union, that was put down with force. There were no strikes in the Soviet Union. And this was partly probably out of a fear that during the Tsar's regime, during Imperial Russia, especially in the late part of Imperial Russia, like leading up to World War I, strikes were quite common in the in Russia during that time. And they ended up being a major factor in the 1905 revolution against Russia and against the Tsar. But now workers can strike in Russia for better working conditions, for better wages. They can actually go on strike without the fear of being repressed by the government. And it also, Perestroika also calls for foreign investment in Russia to kind of help its economy. But Gorbachev realizes that in order to garner this foreign investment, he's going to have to better relations with the West, where a lot of capital money is stored. And although Perestroika and Glasnost are, in, are both enacted, it does not fix the problem, since the market economy will take time to develop. It does not end the rationing, it's shortages of food and supplies and just everyday goods that continue to persist in the Soviet Union. And although Gorbachev is largely trying to reform the nation, he still gets blamed for the ongoing problems by its citizens, who can now publicly criticize the regime. Now, in terms of wanting to better international relations, Gorbachev does this, of course. He needs money, so I need to make friends with the West at least a little bit in order so that they will be more willing to give me money. So, to start off helping with international relations, Gorbachev withdraws the last Soviet troops from Afghanistan during the late 1980s, a war that the Soviet Union had fought for almost for over 10 years by this point and was going nowhere. He withdraws the last troops from Afghanistan, which had largely been a thorn in the West side, who viewed it as a incursion by the Soviets into a free sovereign country who had installed a communist dictatorship. And the United States and other Western nations were supporting the Afghan Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviets. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the loosening of Soviet grip in Afghanistan also leads to Gorbachev deciding, I'm going to also, in order to encourage the West to do business with us, I'm going to pull out the Soviet, a large portion at least, I'm not going to pull it all out, but I'm going to pull a large portion of the Soviet military presence in Eastern Europe out as well to appease the West. And as soon as he does this, those Eastern European countries that the Soviet Union, those satellite states, that really, by the, the late 1980s, really wanted independence, but they couldn't get it because they were Anytime they tried, they would be cracked down on by the Soviet government. Now they're not going to be cracked down on. <coughs> and this causes many of them, by 1989, they start breaking away and de declaring formal independence, not independence, but abolishing their communist governments and instituting new democratic regimes, starting with Poland in 1989, then followed by Czechoslovakia which were both peaceful transitions, and then you got more violent ones, such, such as in Romania, where Sizaku, Sizak, Sizaku, or how you say his name, was actually murdered. Him and his wife were murdered by the civilians in Romania to abolish that government. But this all happens in 1989. Of course, the pinnacle of that year was in November when East and West Germany had been divided since World War II because of the division between the West and the Soviet Union. The Berlin Wall in Berlin is torn down and opened, and this allows Germany to formally reunify as a, as a democratic nation in 1990. Now, in Eastern Europe, this causes widespread dissatisfaction at home because the Soviet hardliners who support communism no matter what, they view that we still have a bad economy under Gorbachev, and now he's letting Eastern Europe basically go to the West. He's basically causing everything to fall apart. And many other republics within the Soviet Union start to say, are we really a country anymore? We're getting weaker and weaker. I think it's about time we declare independence and just give this up. So in 1990, 
those three Baltic states that had largely been invaded and forced into the Soviet Union since the end of World War II of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, they formally declare they are independent from the USSR, from the Soviet Union. They are leaving it. They are no longer part. And this starts the domino effect that eventually takes place within the following year. By 1991, the different republics, the other republics that are still left within the Soviet Union are debating their leaving debating whether or not they will leave and declare independence and Gorbachev and his hardliners are somewhat trying and the hardliners are trying to convince them no let's stay together on eventually Gorbachev agrees to more democratic reforms which ticks off the Soviet hardliners so much that on August 18th of 1991 they basically stage a coup in Russia by communist party leaders to basically keep the Soviet Union together and abolish Gorbachev's reforms. And they do this by sending tanks and the military to Moscow and at the same time placing Gorbachev under house arrest, but lying publicly saying that, oh, it was due to Gorbachev, it's due to Gorbachev having bad health. The public knew better. And this little coup ends up failing when they get to Moscow because they are blocked by barricades and thousands of protesters uh, who are anti-communists who are being led by the main head of the Russian parliament, Boris Yeltsin. And they basically stand in the streets opposing these tanks, in some cases climbing on top of them. They have set up barricades in the streets, and they basically are in support of Gorbachev. And this, after three days, this ultimately brings the coup to an end because they don't want to open fire on the civilians. And the, it's obvious the people are not for continuing the Soviet regime, and they will oppose the coup. On December, this basically ends the last attempt by the Communist Party to retain power and keep the Soviet Union together. This is seen by a failure by most of the other independent little socialist republics within the Soviet Union. And on December 8th, he, Gorbachev ends up meeting with the leaders of the Belarusian and Ukrainian Soviet republics in Minsk in Belarus, and they sign an agreement that officially declares that Ukraine and Belarus are independent and no longer part of the Soviet Union. In the weeks that follow, the other remaining republics, especially in Central Asia, they also follow suit and declare their own independence from the Soviet Union. They are no longer going to be part. Eventually, Russia, when Russia withdraws from this, the USSR or Soviet Union is a defunct state. It's a state only in name. It doesn't actually politically exist anymore because all the republics have now withdrawn and declared independence. It's a defunct state. There's no true Soviet Union. So Gorbachev is now head of a union of a nation that no longer exists by December, by Christmas of 1991. And Gorbachev officially states that he will resign on Christmas Day of that day of 1991 and that the Soviet flag will be lowered at the end of the day to officially mark the end of the Soviet Empire. And Boris Yeltsin is subsequently then elected in 1992 as the first president of the Russian Federation after the Soviet Union comes to a formal close on that Christmas day of 1991 when the Soviet flag is officially lowered at the end of the day from the Kremlin. That is basically a brief little summary of what happened. I mean, you could go more in detail, but in brief events, that is basically what occurs in 1991 and the years prior that really lead up to the Soviet Union just kind of falling apart. Now, we have a couple small images here before we kind of close out that I will go ahead and share to kind of give better context to a little bit of what was going on. Give me one second. This kind of gives you, um, trying to think of what to show first. As we mentioned, we have Gorbachev, who wanted to engage in more relations with the West in order to get that. He was a reformist at heart, and he's still alive today. I actually think the man is not all that terrible. And... He is uh, 90 years old now. It's quite shocking, but he's the last Soviet premier that's still alive, so Soviet secretary, general secretary. But this is a picture of him and President Ronald Reagan in 1986, I think, at Geneva. I don't, it was, I think, 86. 
that they met at Geneva, Switzerland during nuclear arms talks. But him and Reagan were actually became good friends during the during his life during Reagan's lifetime at least because Reagan's no longer with us. Here we have an image of the Soviet of Eastern Europe and what was kind of dominated by Soviet rule. I had kind of have them labeled. You had the Soviet Union here. And then over here, you had all these Eastern European nations. They kind of dominated and controlled through fear that I will militarily basically crack down on you if you deviate from our main line. And by 1989, all these states get rid of their communist governments. They all, And East Germany officially joins with West Germany here to form Germany as a whole. Like right here, 1989, the Berlin Wall falls in Berlin and Germany. The people climbing on top, they're breaking it down finally after almost 25 years or so of it being up. I think actually almost 30 years. I think it was built in 1961. Then we have a picture during the coup in August of Boris Yeltsin who was the chair of the Russian parliament at that time, was kind of advocating for Russia to leave the Soviet Union, and eventually he became the very first president of the Russian Federation. Now, unfortunately, Putin takes power after Yeltsin. So Yeltsin was a, he was a good man. He had good ideals. But his successor is who has turned Russia back toward this line that we're seeing now. Right here we have Russia... Yeltsin on top of a tank in Moscow, I'm trying to pinpoint where he is, right? He's right here. And you can just see there's all kinds of people surrounding him that are in support of Yeltsin and basically of Gorbachev and not in support of this coup to kind of keep the Communist Party in power, kind of keep this Soviet Union going. Then we have a picture of the signing in December 1991, where the remaining Soviet republics, including Yeltsin, who is representing Russia, are kind of signing and separating officially from the Soviet Union. They're all signing their independence statements. This is a map of the former Soviet Union, but I have now included, like, what the modern map looks like. All these white countries were part of the Soviet Union, but here is what the modern political map would be today. But this was, all these countries were once part, and as of today, they are no longer conjoined. You had like over here, Russia, of course, largest and the most important of them all. Then you had the Central Asian ones here, the stands, I call them. And then you had like the breadbasket, Belarus and Ukraine and Moldova. And then you had the Baltic states up here. Finally, this was a photograph from Christmas Day. It was before the end of the day. You can actually go on YouTube and they have the old news footage of them lowering the Soviet flag that day at the end of Christmas Day of 1991 and then raising the Russian tricolor flag of modern day. But this was taken earlier during that day before it was lowered and this shows on, at the Kremlin you have the so old Soviet flag still flying and then nearby you have the modern day Russian tricolor flag that at the end of that day. This was no longer there. Now, I said at the beginning that the fall of the Soviet Union is still relevant to modern international politics. And this ties into the factor that if you go to Russia, while we in the West view the Soviet Union's collapse as a benefit, in Russia, it's highly frowned upon, actually. And Putin, in particular, and his government have kind of stated even today, I believe that they officially introduced a resolution into the Russian Duma to actually actually label the fall of the Soviet Union as a catastrophe, and it was a crime by Yeltsin and all these others that were conspiring against the old Soviet regime. Putin and his government, and his cronies, I should say, have basically put that the Soviet Union was this grand state. Russia was great during this time. We need to go back to that. We were strong then. Not really wanting to recognize that they were a very highly repressive society that was anything but democratic. And that's still very much the case today in Russia. Because Putin was a former KGB agent during the Soviet Union. He admires the old Soviet empire to a T. 
And in his own little dictatorship that he has set up since 2000, he has very much backtracked on a lot of the democratic progress that was attempted during Yeltsin's presidency and kind of made Russia not a communist state, but another authoritarian regime where he holds all the cards. And this shapes Russia's policy today because Putin is very much in his – one of his ultimate dreams, it seems, would be a recreation of the old Soviet Union. That is what why we're so concerned partially like with Ukraine right now, which has been in the news because there is over 100,000 Russian troops on the Ukrainian border that look as if they're getting ready to invade, which we all know in 2014, Russia illegally seized the Crimea Peninsula from, from Ukraine. And Putin has made comments claiming that ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, with NATO's expansion into countries that were once under Soviet domination and the other former republics of the Soviet Union breaking away, Russia's sovereignty and security has been threatened significantly since 1991, as Putin claims. And he claims that's as justification for his actions in defending Russia's uh, aggression toward these other nations. So the fall of the Soviet Union definitely plays into the modern context because it explains why Putin's government somewhat acts the way it does. It admires the old Soviet regime. It wants to go back to some form of that regime in a way, and it wants to revive this old Soviet empire where they view that Russia was great, that Russia was powerful, nothing could stand up to Russia. And I seen in the news earlier today another comment that I think is also highly accurate. And it came from former Soviet uh, General Secretary Gorbachev, who was still alive, and he announced that after the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States grew arrogant. And some might view this as, well, he's just Russian, he's just trying to say things about us, and I'll probably, and you'll probably see this little comment, and you're probably going to be like, well, you're not patriotic, you're claiming that you agree with Gorbachev. Well, I do agree with Gorbachev, but not for an unpatriotic measure, but because it's actually true. If we really look at it, after 1991, after the Soviet Union falls, the United States it has it's in a victory streak. It's basically in this – there's this view in society that America has won the biggest conflict it's ever had to deal, the biggest rivalry, and that no, no one in this world can now challenge America. We're the sole superpower. While at the same time, while we're in the celebratory mood during the 1990s, we neglectfully kind of turned a blind eye toward other threats that are rising in the world at that time. In particular, we paid no attention to the Middle East where we had just helped the Afghani, Afghani people fight against the Soviets, but didn't realize that we had also, that our subsequent wars in the 1990s, such as the Gulf War, were not having that big of a positive impact on the Muslim peoples, at least not the extremists. And we turned a blind eye during the 1990s to terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda, who by 2001, we kind of had a rude awakening to when 9-11 happened. We also, during the 1990s, kind of turned a blind eye to China. And honestly, I mean, we basically had this, we were arrogant. We basically threw every care aside saying we've won, there is nothing to worry about, while at the same time, we were not watchful for new threats that were emerging on the world stage toward American security. And now look at the problems that we have faced. We've gone through a war on terrorism that, although it's died down from what it once was, it's still very much ongoing. And China is rapidly becoming the newest superpower that is a major threat to United States security, to American security. And all of this really started during the 1990s. China starts modernizing its economy during the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, because it doesn't want to collapse itself. But the United States does very little during the 1990s to really actually pay attention to what's going on in China. They turn a blind eye because they're arrogant. They're in this view that we have won. There's nothing that will happen. And in the process, we kind of, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say it. We kind of uh, mess ourselves up for the future. So although Gorbachev is, of course, Russian, and some people would denounce that, I am actually going to say I would be in agreement with a Russian for once because he's not wrong. We were arrogant. 
and we don't want to admit it, but we were. We turned a blind eye to new threats that were emerging on the world stage after the fall, and now we're having to deal with the consequences. But anyway, that would be our brief little uh, discussion on that topic. I just wanted to do this video more for the historical milestone anniversary that was coming. I know it's Christmas Eve and all, but I wanted to go ahead and get that done. So that basically concludes for today. Uh, we'll have our next video next week. I'm hoping on the Russian Revolution, but we'll see how that goes. As always, like, subscribe, leave any comments down in the comment section below. Any suggestions, feel free to leave them. So as always, hope you're doing well during the coronavirus pandemic. Hope everyone is actually staying safe. Have a Merry Christmas Day. Have a great Christmas Eve, but overall, have a Merry Christmas, and may God bless you all.